Welcome to the National Association of Realtors Center for Realtor Development Podcast with your host, Monica Neubauer. To get more information about the courses and credentials discussed here, just visit our site at www.onlinelearning.realtor and use the coupon code PODCAST, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, to obtain 15% off the price of any online class. And now on to the show. Welcome to the Center for Realtor Development Podcast. I'm Monica Neubauer, your host. This month, we have a special kind of episode for you. It's actually the recording from a panel that I led at the 2018 Realtors Conference and Expo in Boston. And it's called Multi-Platform Marketing for Maximizing Content. And this is the way modern marketing is done. How are we creating content and sharing content and who are we sharing it with and how is it being made available to the public? I have invited four amazing folks who participated in this panel with me, TJ Pierce from Boise, Idaho, Moore Zucker and Jamie Slough from Denver, Colorado, and Dave Kasky from Manhattan Beach, California. Now, They have all done a fantastic job of really maximizing their social media and their marketing. I'm not going to introduce them now because the panel introductions are part of the recording. It is the recording from the panel in Boston. There is some fantastic content in this discussion. So you might want to get your pen and paper out and take some notes. Enjoy. Let me introduce you to us, to me and this fabulous panel here. And then I've got a couple things for you before we get started. And uh, so let me just do a quick introduction. There's our names up there. And you have the handout online. Have any of you seen it already? It is extensive and worth downloading, okay? It's got more scoop on it than we're going to have time to talk about. And it also has all of our contact information and places to follow us all on social media, websites, you know, whatever follow-up you might want to do. So you might want to get the handout if that's something you are interested in. Okay, there's me. Oh, well. Okay. Monica Neubauer, that's me. I am the podcast host. Where are my podcasters in the room? Anybody? I mean, anybody listen to podcasts? My podcast listeners. Oh, y'all are an awesome crowd. I'm going to give you a quick ad for my podcast that I host with the Center for Realtor Development with NAR. So when you go to your podcast app, if you want to listen to it, you search for Center for Realtor Development. Okay, that's what you need to look for. It's awesome. It's an hour a month. We put out one a month. So that's kind of what I do. I speak, I talk, and I sell. There you go. Let me introduce you to the real experts here. I am so excited. I put this panel up to suggest this, and they said, yeah, Monica, do this panel. And I invited um, these four people, three teams, to come, and they all said yes, and I just did a happy dance at home because I was like, this is going to be so awesome for y'all. All All right, let me introduce them to you, and I've got a little written bio here so we can be accurate. Okay, T.J. Pierce. He is the owner and team leader of Mid-Century Homes. That's his specialty, Mid-Century Homes in Boise, Idaho. A decade of corporate sales experience with Xerox and Canon produced the foundation that he needed to create his business in 2016. So he's only been doing this for a few years. And wait till you see how awesome and together it is. All right. So his team provides compressive services to Mid-Century enthusiasts in Boise, with plans to offer these services across North America as opportunity allows. He welcomes you to introduce yourself after the session if you have any connections to significant mid-century architecture. Where's my fans for mid-century architecture in the room? Wow, look at that, a pretty good section. All right, you want to connect with TJ. All right, Jamie Slough is our next guest and panelist, and she's the co-founder of Team Denver Homes with Kentwood Real Estate in Cherry Creek in Denver. Her passion for marketing started at an early age, leading to degrees in journalism, advertising, and digital design. Recently, she earned an MBA, and so she could be the best in her field. I'm a little jealous. I don't have one. I love that she um, has that. All right. With more than 10 years marketing experience in multiple industries and working as the marketing director for Kentwood Real Estate, Jamie transitioned to selling after falling in love with the real estate industry. So we all have that in common with Jamie, don't we? We love the real estate industry. Welcome, Jamie Slough. All right, well, and welcome to TJ. Welcome to Jamie. Yes. And our next panelist is her co-team leader, Moore Zucker. 
And she is also, as I said, the co-founder of Team Denver Homes with Kentwood Real Estate Cherry Creek. And her innovative approach to marketing real estate has led her to become a public speaker at conferences such as Inman Connect, Who's Who in Luxury Real Estate, NCON, WFG's Refresh, and more. And she's a multiple award winner and also the founder of the Denver Ear, which you'll hear more about, one of Denver's top lifestyle blogs. And that's going to play into their story a little bit. Welcome more. Our final panelist is Dave Kasky, and he is Manhattan Beach's number one luxury realtor with a 2018 sales volume of more than $230 million. I think he might have something to say. Hmm. He has the top performing real estate team at Strand Hill Properties, Christie's International Real Estate. He's been ranked number 12 in LA's top luxury brokers by The Real Deal and number 16 in LA's residential real estate agents by the Los Angeles, Los Angeles Business Journal, making him the number one South Bay luxury agent by sales volume. And Dave's team, Kasky and Kasky and Associates, and his wife is here, Jen, and also TJ's, uh, one of his team is also here. Where's Vance? I don't see him. Over there. So we've got, uh, you know, some team members here with us. All right, so Dave's team, Kasky and Kasky and Associates, has been repeatedly ranked on the thousand list by Real Trends and named the Wall Street Journal as the number one real estate team in the South Bay area by sales volume. And in 2018, his team received three platinum level and two gold level awards from the Association of Marketing and Communication Professionals for their unique efforts in electronic media, social media, and interactive media. And Ladies and gentlemen, that is how I found these award-winning panelists. Let's give them all a round of applause and welcome them for coming today. All right, here's a few reminders. I told you about the handouts. Now, because they have so much to share and I want them to be able to get through their content, they're going to just share their session. We're not going to have any questions. It's not going to be a Q&A format initially. I'm going to have each of one of them share what they've brought to um, present to you. And then at the end of our time, we will have a Q&A period. And you can see there's microphones there. So if you have some questions while one of them is speaking, go ahead and make a note so you'll remember it to come back to at the end. We would look forward to that. All right. Introductions over. Let the content begin. Now, there may be a few of you who saw that title and said, I'm not quite sure what they're talking about in this complicated title, but I'm going to go check it out. So I will guarantee you that beginner, intermediate, advanced, you're going to get something out of this today. And that's why my last comment there, find your takeaway. We're going to give you a whole lot of tips today, and the handout has even more tips on it if you want to get that for later. But I want you all to take at least one takeaway for your level where you are in your business. And so always keep looking for that application point wherever you are to get started. All right. A few things for our beginners here. What is content? My daughter, she does some YouTube channels and she's like, oh, mom, this content word. You have probably all heard about content. What is content? We're creating content. We're content creators. And if you create enough content and you get enough followers, you might be famous. Famous in your niche. That's the idea, right? We want to be famous in our town or famous in our niche so that we can get more business. It can be photos. It can be a blog. If you like to write, it could be a blog. If you are just at home with video and you dig it, you make some videos. It's not difficult if you're comfortable with it. It may not be for everyone, but there's something here for everyone. How many of you have had one listing in the last six months? Yes, it's not a trick question. <laughs> if you have a listing, you therefore have content and something to share. And uh, so let's, you know, so you see there, that is just a photo. That's a little meme that I put together. I downloaded a little meme app on my phone. I put my cool picture of Montana in there with a quote that I like. Boom. Put it up on Instagram. There, you know, I'm just kind of giving you ideas. That was my own. And uh, then here, so yesterday I did a video, two days ago I did a video for this class with the Conference Live folks. And I had one of the photographers just take some pictures. So now I have the video that was created. I have the photo about the video shoot so I could talk about the video shoot. I have one, you know, 
half an hour little session and I've got all kinds of information from it. I can share the video, I can share the photo from the video. So it's just living life and capturing key things that will be and can be interesting to the target market. Ah, that's kind of the key thing, but I'll let them get into that in just a minute. So what is multi-platform marketing? It's using that information that you wrote, you photographed, you videotaped it, you hosted it, you created it. This is not going and finding videos or you can share other people's content and TJ's gonna talk about that, but this isn't you going and looking for images on Google. Don't do that. They're copyrighted. They belong to somebody else. You might get in trouble if you do that. So take your own photos because you all have those amazing things on your phone, the camera. One of my good friends, I said, we're going on a big trip. Should I go buy a really nice new camera? And he said, Monica, when was the last time you updated your phone? And I said, it's been a while. He said, you need to go get the iPhone 10. That needs to be your new phone. And I did. And oh my gosh, my photos are sick. <laughs> They're like amazing. This iPhone 10 is scaring me. So anyway, so share it in multiple ways to people who will like it. And so that's what it is. I've got a couple visual examples just to kind of help you if you don't have kind of a slot for this. Kathy Kirpan at NAR, she is the one who produces the podcast that I do for NAR. And so we start with the podcast in, in the middle there. I get the guests. I record the content. We send it all to be finished. And then she shares it all these other places. So now she's got this content. We've got the podcast that she, you know, that I created with the editors. She shares information about it on Instagram. We create a handout so that when I travel, I can talk to people about it and I share it on paper. That MVP prize, sometimes they give that away. You know, it's like, hey, if you go, you know, view the podcast, we'll give you, an, uh, you know, an NAR prize or something for doing that. She shares it on Facebook and Twitter. And we also have, with the podcast, show notes. And she takes the show notes and turns that into a blog that she then shares on RIS Media. And lastly, they put it into video form, and it's on YouTube. One piece of content. We do the podcast, and it gets all of those uses and shares out. Because how many of you go to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram all, all the time? No, not so much. A few of you nodding your heads. I know there's a few of you social media junkies out there doing this. I know. I know. But most of you are only going to one. So it's okay to post to two or three because not everybody is on all the same platforms. Some of us are. I know it could be a problem. All right, let me show you how content looks for a listing. It's basic content. We all just raised our hands. We've got it. We have professional photos for it. Maybe we have professional video that we took as well. But we can take casual photos and videos as well. And I'll give you an example of that in just a second. So when you're there at the house, when it's looking awesome, and the photographer's there, and the lighting's good, just take a few extra little detail photos or casual photos that tend to fit in that social atmosphere or on a blog post in a different way, and you'll see how it goes. All right, let me just go through a few examples here. So this is just kind of the single web page for this listing. There's the professional pictures. You know, I had the rider, the sign at the street, boom. And uh, here's the, kind of the general photos for it. Well, then I wrote a blog about it. My website has a blog on it. Actually, it is a blog. And so I wrote a blog about luxury real estate and my luxury listing. Put it up there, and you can write about anything. Always want to keep fair housing in mind when you're writing something interesting for a property. But you can write about some of the cool details, put some interesting photos in there, wrote a blog, then I shared my blog on my Facebook business page. Then I shared it on Twitter. I don't follow Twitter much, but I still like to post stuff there. And then, this is my favorite, I posted on Instagram. I took this cool photo, what it looks like from the bottom of the hill that wasn't in the professional photos, and shared it, hashtag luxury real estate. I got like 15 new followers who follow luxury real estate. I thought, well, this is cool, right? I'm connecting with a network as well as marketing my photo. And then it's on Zillow. Yes, the public is on Zillow. It's a good thing for it to be on Zillow because that's where the people are. So it's everywhere. I can use one listing in so many places. And that's just an example of some of the many places you can put it. 
and I'm going to let them give you more suggestions as to where to put it and how to decide what you're doing. So that is the basic idea of what is content and what is spreading it about and that you have content in lots of places. It's just becoming aware of where it is. All right. TJ, you ready? I'm ready. All Very right. cool. Well, thank you. Appreciate you sharing all of that. I've learned a few things. So we are mid-century homes. Curious, anybody following us on Instagram or Facebook out there? That'd be awesome if it was nobody. One. No. <laughs> so get your phones out real quick. Pull them out. I'm the one that uses my phone in the middle of people speaking. So Hey, you're speaking. It's not that I'm offending. I just like engaging with technology as I'm learning. So I invite you to do the same thing. Pull your phones out. How many of you are preferring Facebook these days? Personally, for personal consumption, I go to Facebook. Raise your hand. Okay? Personally. And for personal consumption, just viewing, how many of you are preferring Instagram these days? Woo! You know, here's my thought. Um, Use the channel that you're most comfortable with first and start there because what she just explained can be extremely overwhelming. Yes. Those are so many channels to be worrying about, but you got to start somewhere. We started with Facebook. I fought it for probably about a year and a couple months. I'm like, I don't want to get into Instagram. I know Facebook. I can't do anything else. And then somebody showed me how to use Instagram. I'm almost preferring Instagram these days over Facebook, but it's also a generational thing. I think uh, probably above 45, I've seen we, we hit a lot more Facebook folks um, in that demographic, and below 35 is a lot more, or 45 is a lot more Instagram uh, followers. But for those of you, since the majority of you are on Instagram and like it, open up Instagram real quick and search for Boise Mid Century Homes. One word B O I S E M I D Century Homes. Raise your hand if you've got it pulled up. Okay, now, now hit follow. Okay, you'll find pictures like this on our Instagram feed, also Facebook. And uh, this is a, this kind of classic mid-century home in our Boise market. So home built in the 50s and 60s, and that, that's what we specialize in. As we've been doing this, my theory is this. Every piece of content we create, every event that we host every transaction that we close. Our primary purpose, it's all about fostering a community of like-mindedness around one of the most fascinating and stunning areas of residential architecture that I think the world has ever seen. And so for us, we're, not, we're a boutique model. We, we're not necessarily, we want more production, but we actually don't care about the production. We care about having an excuse to wake up tomorrow and get inside of one of these cool mid-century homes. So the team that we've put together is a group of people that all feel the same way. Um, every single one of these folks, uh, one of the qualifications on our team is, you have to love grandma's home. I can't build that into you. You either do or you don't. And so if you love grandma's home, there's a conversation for us to have as to why you should be on our team. And every single one of these people, including Vance, who's hiding somewhere. Where'd you go, Vance? There you are. He keeps moving. So uh, including Vance who also helps us um, a lot on our uh, social media stuff. So he's helping create content right now, and the, the two of us are, are primarily on the team there, um, the ones that are contributing to content creation, um, and then the channels that we're leveraging most often are both Facebook and Instagram. So how do we market our company across multiple marketing channels? Uh, we'll get into that. First off, like, has already been explained, we build a digital library. And she is absolutely right, uh, because in this self-produced content category, that device over on the left-hand side, if you don't have an iPhone or another like styled piece of technology with a great piece of camera equipment on it, uh, you're missing out on a lot of opportunity because these pieces of technology are stunning, what they can do with, with pictures. We totally believe in professionally produced photography, but there's a place for certain styles of content. And one of those that, that we do on a fairly regular basis through Instagram is through the use of um, our iPhones that we use or a Samsung device that Vance has. 
The other pieces of technology that we use once we've taken a picture is Canva. If you're trying to create content and you're trying to find a software platform, mobile or digital or, or app-based, that you can start using your content that you've created to package that photograph better like you did with your picture of Montana. Mm -hmm. um, Canva's a really great free app to use um, that's kind of like a page layout design platform um, for your photography and it allows you to do it if you're doing it through Facebook or if you're doing it through Instagram. It tries to help you pick the channel so that it creates the right size for that specific medium. And then, like I said, we use Instagram and Facebook with the content that we've created um, to make sure to plug it you know, into those channels as we're marketing. So we can take one picture, and then Instagram has a pretty cool feature, some of you probably using it, where you just share it, right? You link it to your Facebook account, and then on Instagram, if it's, a, if it's content that's worthy to share on Facebook as well, because they are two very different channels that serve two very different purposes, but sometimes if there's a picture that you also want shared on Facebook, you can just hit the share icon on Instagram, it'll push it over to Facebook. So what about um, other forms of content that we create? Like I said, professionally produced content, which is both our website and um, a video that we created. Both of these were services that none of us on our team know how to do. We subbed it out um, and we helped people create this for us. We've got a video on the left there that's about a six minute video. We're more of a um, educational kind of instruction style video about what a mid-century home is and what our business does, which you can find on our website. Uh, but both of those pieces are professionally produced content. We also, on our um, website, we show a lot of our uh, professional photography. So we host it up there. We do um, what's called homeowner features that are not necessarily homes that are for sale but we're trying to um, demonstrate to our community in Boise what mid-century homes exist there and use those kind of as launching pads for people to know what's possible in our market. Uh, because usually when you engage a local homeowner that has a really cool mid-century home, they've also engaged local resources to help put this home together. So then we can answer some questions like, wow, that's great, where'd you get that turquoise stove? Oh, that was installed in the 50s. You can't get it anywhere. So other people's content. Know that one on the right, that Instagram page there? I don't know More? if you can see it, TV. More? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's the Denver Ear. Uh, there's also another Instagram page in the middle there that's a real estate agent um, that we like a lot. And, you know, we're really, I, I'm sure a lot of you do it this way too, but we're really collaborative with other agents. We're not combative. We, we like playing in the same sandbox together and having fun doing that. So this agent actually represents quite a few mid-century properties in our market. And like she said, there are copyrighted issues. We always call the agents and say, hey, great listing. Do you mind if we share your photography on the channels that we've created that market specifically to a group of people that will actually appreciate your style of home? And Andrea Pettit from Boise is happy to let us share that all the time. So we grab a ton of content from her page and we'll just reshare it. Uh, and then Atomic Ranch is a um, niche market group or publication that focuses already on marketing to the people that we want to market to. Um, and they've done a really good job at sharing our content through their page, but equally true, we grab content from their page, both Facebook and Instagram, and we'll reshare if we feel like it's relevant content to our target market as well. I love sharing other people's content. You know why? Why? Because you don't have to create it. When you're sharing other people's content, you were yeah. talking to us about your relationship with Atomic Ranch. Yeah. Since they're a national provider in your niche, yeah. how does that kind of benefit? How does it benefit you to engage with them? Well, so for us, we're a niche market boutique real estate company. What I want to know when I'm marketing is whether or not I'm reaching my appropriate target market for the products that we want to be selling. And so it was very important for us when we started our company that we identify other companies that are already marketing to our target audience. And this is a big group that already does. They share the audience of the people that we want to be getting the attention of. So um, when you're going out there to an Atomic Ranch, which I'm sure you guys do some of this too, but for us at Atomic Ranch, we're tagging them in our photos. Yeah. We're hashtagging the hashtags that they use. And then we're trying to just capitalize on attracting their audience over to our page. Sure, we're in Boise, Idaho, but Boise, Idaho is the fast growing city in the country. And if somebody's looking at relocating and they're a mid-century enthusiast, it's going to be a real quick, easy way to find us 
if they're already kind of pushing our content, we're highlighting each other's stuff. Right. So yeah, that's that's really handy, and it's you know they shared probably three posts within the last 45 days of ours. And almost every time they share a post of ours, we collect like 250 to 300 new followers wow. to the page. Yeah, that's nice. So that's just collaboration. And again, trying to find people that are already marketing to your target market of people that you want to be doing business with. So we share that content, like I say, stated, through Facebook, Instagram, website. Uh, website's a little bit more static. It doesn't really move very much, whereas our Facebook and our Instagram stuff's changing all the time. It's really easy to upload and produce or create or share content through those channels. Those are the two that we lean on most often. We kind of use our website more as a archive of, you know, past body of work. But so. an archive of a past body of work and past words and past commentaries yep. is going to create where am I? Do you know where I'm leading you? Well, I mean, a lot of SEO. Exactly. Absolutely. Stuff. Yeah. It creates that forever SEO. For yep. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keyword terms, search, stuff that you can find on the web. I think because our niche and what we do, if you did a quick search mid-century real estate, we would probably be one of the top five groups that you would see in your browser, even though we're only in Boise, Idaho. But it is because of what we've done on our website. Right. Um, and we get a lot of our stuff from our Facebook push to our website automatically. Um, so that also helps with keyword term search SEO. And we haven't paid for zero. We've paid for zero SEO. We don't, awesome. we don't even pay. So specifically in each channel, I think it's worth noting, um, we've been using this for about three years. We have just over 4,000 followers. This is a really good channel for promoting events, articles, and running targeted ads. Uh, this is where we spent the most amount of money. Uh, we've spent about 13 grand in three years through Facebook trying to target um, specifically to our target audience. I've been trained by some people that know how to do it, and I've paid for those services to help them teach me. Um, but man, if you get into Ads Manager through Facebook and get into a really high level of targeting to your, the people that you want to be doing business with, it's an extremely powerful tool. Um, so we've collected a lot of attention um, and actually lead development strategies out of making sure that we're running appropriate ads um, that take them to landing pages where we collect name, number, email address. Facebook does that really, really well. Instagram does not. But Instagram is good. We've been using for about two years. We have just about 7,800 followers. We love sharing compelling pictures. That's what Instagram is really good for. Uh, fortunate for us, a mid-century home is really sexy visually. So pictures are a great tool for us to reach our target market. Um, through Instagram with pictures of mid-century styled homes. Definitely use hashtags. Use them that are appropriate for both your company and your target market. Um, and make sure that, again, of the people that are already marketing to your target market, like for us, Atomic Ranch, find who those other people are that are sharing your target market and figure out what their hashtags are and start using theirs too. We've probably spent less than 100 bucks on Instagram. Great tool for free advertisement. We actually do get quite a bit of business through Instagram. And then website, been using for about two years. We get about 1,000 visitors a month, which is probably like a dink in the bucket for Moore's Denver ear. But we still do get 1,000 followers a month to our website, which we're kind of excited about. Um, I'll probably get some lessons from Moore when I'm done here so I can learn how to increase that. Uh, but stats of body of work, like I mentioned, great for archiving material that you want your audience to reference in the past, like our homeowner features. We've highlighted about, what's our number, 27 homes on our website that we've highlighted as homeowner features. And we're always pushing people to check those homeowner features out. And I think we probably spent close to about $10,000 uh, by building our website and pushing content that direction. So uh, the last thing that we do that I think may be a little bit unique to our model, um, again, because we have a high value for engaging the community of people that we want to be doing business with, we do a lot of live events in order to get in front of these people and build relationships with them way before they're even a future potential client. And so the three places um, that we're doing that is home tours, the second Saturday of every month in our market. And again, we use Facebook to push these events most often. We usually grab a screenshot and throw it over on Instagram, but it looks really ugly, but it serves the purpose. So we do that too, just to reach the Instagram audience for our events. 
but then we'll delete it later because we don't want it to stay there again because it looks ugly. But uh, Facebook for events, we also do a uh, first time home buyer class, which Vance is in charge of. We're kind of retooling and rekinking that right now. Um, and then once a year, we also do um, a movie premiere or a movie screening. And so um, these are just places for people to show up that are into that mid-century era of home in our market. Um, and we use those just to build the community, get to know the people. The benefit to this stuff is that 45% of our business this year has actually been done in off-market transactions because we know the people that own these mid-century homes. And oftentimes we have buyers in our back pocket for these homes. So we can broker deals between buyer and seller before anybody knows about it. It's the black market of mid-century homes in Boise, Idaho. <laughs> Want access? Call us, let us know. <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's worth mentioning all these things. You can take a quick peek why we do those. Uh, we two or three homes. It's always a place where we can invite somebody. Everyone's welcome to join. We don't care who you are, if you love mid-century architecture, if you don't. If you're going to buy, if you're not going to buy, we don't care. Come check it out. Let us teach you more. I don't know, 30 to 45 people join us every year for whatever movie we put on. It's a really fun event. It gives us an opportunity to cast the vision for what we do and why we do it, uh, because architecture can be so much more than just a box to live in. So we kind of cast that vision through the movie that we show. And, um, but don't you think people love to understand the architecture and the story behind the house? Oh, it absolutely. Creates, it creates yeah. a fondness for it beyond yep. just that emotional side. Yeah, and I think the, the architects of that era, um, the way they were building homes and what they were doing when they were building them, there was reason and purpose behind it in a way that was much more than just functional. It was actually a, a form of contribution to somebody's life, and we try to help people understand that through that movie premiere that we do. It's a cool movie. And then uh, we're actually doing this for the very first time in December. We're going to do a Mad Men party. And uh, we're going to host it at one of the most, one of a very cool um, architect um, home in our market, um, lived in by a couple that uh, have treated the home really, really well and are wonderful hosts for an event like this. Um, so this will be really fun, too. We already have, like, pre-reservation numbers. Uh, like 150 people have stated that they want to come. Well, they can accommodate 30. So we're going to charge a premium ticket and kind of let it be a self-selecting group of people, and we'll have a lot of fun. So yeah. anyway, uh, conclusions. I don't know. What am I saying about my conclusions? I can't read that. Uh, we're in the business of making mid-century dreams come true, and we do that by building a digital library of content, blasting that content through channels that we know will reach our target audience, and inviting people to join us in events, hopes that we get conversations started and relationships built to service um, those that call themselves or soon will call themselves mid-century enthusiasts. If you have any questions, there's my email address and Vance's email address. We're happy to answer them for you, or we'll stick around afterwards, and you can ask us questions. We're happy to help. Now the real experts. All right, well, let's give TJ a round of applause. Thank you so much. All right. Jamie, Jamie and more. So we're going to talk about um, creating content that lasts. And really quick, we're going to go into our team. So Moore and I officially started together a couple years ago. And this year, we brought on two more agents with us. And so we just kind of like to give them credit, too, because we can't do what we do without them. Um, a little bit about us is uh, we kind of talked about it already. I was a marketing director for Kentwood before I started selling. And more actually came from the technology side. So we come at real estate with a very different goal and perspective in mind. And it's really about using the marketing and technology to sell homes instead of just selling homes and then having to use those things to do it. So um, don't wait for opportunity to create it. This is really important to us. When we started selling, we had people in the industry that were like, that's great that you want to do these things, but like, it takes time to really get out there in this market and to really start having some high production and doing the things you want to do. So, you know, just it takes time. And I'm, we're not patient people. If any of you know us, <laughs> you know that. So we're like, well, that doesn't work for us. We're going to go create it for ourselves. So this is um, a screenshot of our website there in the red. And we're the number one website in our company, even over one of our office's website. And we put this up here not to brag about the people that go to our website, but because this is all done, because everything we do, we drive to our website. And that's done by creating content. So we're going to talk to you guys about two different ways that we create content for our website. More is going to go into the Denver ear, which you've heard a lot about now already. And that process, for a lot of us, how many of you guys actually blog? OK. Not a lot of us. And it's a huge commitment. So 
There's another way that we get content out there, and that's through our PR and relationships with the media that can create content much faster, and it's a lot easier if you guys don't want to create this whole blog that you have to commit to. It's a really good way to still be out there and get that online content. So let's talk about the news. What is news? News is whatever we decide it is. And reporters, news channels, magazines, they're hungry for information from you guys. How many of you guys actually submit press releases and do things like that in your market? How many of you guys know that agent that's like, how are they always on the news? How are they always in the paper? That's like that same person all the time. <laughs> Is it you? I was going to say, how many of you are those people? Are it's yeah, by it? creating those relationships and, and really getting out there, making that an intentional part of your business. Everything you guys do every single day is new somehow. You just need to figure out what that story looks like. So here's just a couple examples of some of the stories that we've actually had published this year. Um, from the far side, we had a listing that was, we got it as a luxury listing expired. It was on the market for a year before we got it. Very difficult listing because of how unique it was and the neighborhood that it was in. And so we created a whole story around it, and that was in the Denver Post. Um, the one on the lower side here, Moore does a huge event that she'll talk about a little bit later. And it's really great to have, if you guys have things that you're doing in your neighborhoods, the outreach and community, people love seeing that type of stuff. So make a story about it. Uh, we also network and you know, work with some of the other brokerages in our area, and so that's one up at the top there about uh, working on a couple listings that were in the same neighborhood with a nearby brokerage that we are affiliated with. And then this far one is our most recent. It's a listing we currently have. It's the perfect, what we've decided, house for someone downsizing from the luxury market that's kind of across the street from this house. And that's been a huge draw into the buyers seeing this house. So we created a whole article about downsizing from the luxury market and where you go. All of these were published in printed media, but what's really important to us, more so than the printed media, is how we use it online. So this is our website, and we have a press page on here, which we can look at. And these are just some of the stories that we've put out there this year. So what's great about that is even if it doesn't get picked up, put press releases out there, if they don't get picked up, you can still have them live on your website. And it's links you can put on social, you can direct people there. We send them to some of our clients in certain situations uh, to read about those articles. And it's, again, putting everybody back to your website. This is one of the ones that we did when we teamed up, talking about us joining up as a team. If you team up with an agent in your neighborhood, like, how's that news? You gotta make it news. And so we talked about our backgrounds in marketing and how we're out there to really create this new era of real estate. We're changing the industry in our market. And that's what we talked about, not just the fact that Moore and Jamie teamed up in Denver. So when you're creating these press releases, we have a writer who does it for us. He creates it and then he sends it to us and then we dissect it and kind of use that as like our, our guideline and then go in and like change the wording and change the order and always be thinking when you're putting these together, why does a consumer care about this? Why is someone going to read this? There always needs to be value, whether it's about the market or about your team or whatever it is. What does that do for your clients that are out there looking at this information? And always turn it back around to make sure that you're providing value to the market. And we're going to get into Moore's part of it with the Denver Ear. This is something that, you know, like I said, my part of it, the press, doing that, you can go build those relationships. You can send out press releases. It doesn't take, you know, you still need to be intentional about it, but it doesn't take this long strategy of really, you know, commitment of making it happen. So it's an easy way to get started with getting some really good content online. Uh, if you're going to do something like take on a blog, it's a project and you have to be really passionate about it and you have to kind of plant the seeds and like wait for it to grow. It doesn't happen overnight. So more we'll kind of dive into what that looks like. So building a relationship with the media, give us like a... How do you do that? Step one, step two, where are you going? Well, it's going to come up in a second. Perfect. Okay, well, so my thought, I just wanted intro. to, you know, nail home here what Jamie said. Kind of the thing is, if there's not enough news in your town, you can create the news. You can be the news. And I, I love that idea even about the news. You know, even if they don't pick it up, it's a press release. Put it, put it out there. So create the news, be the news, and be friends with the newscasters. Because guess what? They're kind of like a, your appraisers. If you do more work for them, they will like you because you're helping them do their job well. Yeah. And, then, and then they'll keep coming back to you. And like she said, if you're not getting the press release picked up, obviously that's awesome. And you get calls from people when you're on the front page of the paper. Absolutely. 
But if it's on your website, you can still share it all over social. Like nobody else doesn't know that it wasn't actually picked up. And again, then it lives there, and that's the important part. So I'm gonna jump into a little bit longer strategy. This is for、um, you guys that are thinking about what can I do on the side to build like a side gig that's going to feed into my business later on, and you gotta have passion for it. And this is about planting seeds. That are going to sprout later on, so you're not going to see immediate business from this. But if you're looking to have a business that's going to be long-lasting over time, this you're going to see convert into a lot of business, but later on. So I like a lot of business, so I'm going to invest. So I created a blog. It's called the Denver Ear, and the Denver Ear does not have anything to do with real estate. The Denver Ear is about local community events,、um, businesses, things to do, lifestyle. And first of all, there's two reasons. The first reason is because when you are selling real estate, you are actually selling real estate. You know, newsflash within a community. So when someone buys a house, they're not just buying a house. They're buying a house, and they're buying the neighborhood, and they're buying the shops around it, and they're buying the schools around it. So when you remember that you're selling a community and not a property, then you're going to remember that people always want to know what's going on in their community. And by you being the voice of that kind of information, you become the expert in that community within houses and the community itself. So I opened the blog and I decided, and this is how it was. I was literally hearing a session、um, at another conference, and someone said something like, "Like, why are you guys sharing、um, all the time?" You know articles about appraisals, and then I got home, and coincidentally, I'm laying in bed, two in the morning, can't fall asleep, and I see an agent. One of my friends was posting an article on like five things to do at an inspection, and it had zero likes. And I'm thinking, clearly, no one's gonna like this. And even if you did like it or you were interested in it. How many of you are going to share an article that is about the inspection? First of all, you have to be in the process of buying or selling a home at that exact current time to have that even an interesting topic for you. Second of all, even if you are interested, your friends are not going to care either. So that I thought, like as a realtor, I want to produce content that my clients, friends, and spheres are going to share it. And then my name is going to be on there over and over again. So they're going to be basically showcasing me as an agent every single day without sharing real estate content. So that's what the Denver Ear is, and I write about things to do, like where to sit here, like where to watch outdoor movies in the summer, you know, what kind of festivals there are,、um, and this is a way for my clients to continue remembering me long after the deal ends. And another reason why I like the Denver Ear is because once you start producing content for lifestyle and local businesses, guess what? Those local businesses all wake up and they all of a sudden see you as that voice, and then they reach out to you and they're like, "Hey, I noticed that you have this blog. Do you mind letting your readers know about this new up-and-coming restaurant?" And guess what happens then? A really interesting situation where the Denver Ear is all about secrets. So I get a lot of businesses that reach out and say, "Hey, we're opening a new restaurant,、um, in, like in six months." So then, when we go show properties to our clients, we're like, "Hey, you know this property over here? Nobody knows this, but us." But a new restaurant is going to be opening down the street from you, and that gives us additional value that no other agent has in our market because we have this lifestyle blog that feeds into the real estate. <laughs> There you go. And、um, TJ said, "Black market intel." It's good to have secrets, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Obviously, the Denver Ears all circled around secrets, so that's definitely a big thing. So I decided to build a blog outside of TeamDenverHomes.com simply because I wanted to bring people into the real estate from the back door. I didn't want people to see the real estate website and then be turned off by it. So I decided to create a brand new website and just rely on referral traffic. That's a really much longer-term strategy because then you're hoping someone to figure out your website and then lead on to the next one. But I figured that I'm okay with that because if they're going to transfer over, then they're actually generally more likely to close a deal because they took that extra step to reach the real estate. So it's longer, but it's it's more of a conversion. So that's a little quick starting. So 
First of all, um, the most important thing to know about blogging, if you are deciding to go down this path, it doesn't matter how often you blog. And I'm just gonna like make sure that you guys like remember that because I hear a lot of times people are like, I don't have time to blog um, that much, you know, running a business, there's no time. Well, guess what? It's better to have a blog with five posts and each one of them has good quality content than have a hundred that are crap, excuse my French. So I don't believe in those articles that it feels like, you know what clickbait is? When you click on something and you reach an article and you're like, oh, that was a waste of my time. Like, don't be associated with crappy content. So if you're going out of your way to write a blog post, make sure you take the time to have it done well and you do enough research. So I make sure that I can have an article come out sometimes five times a week. Sometimes I'll have it once every two weeks because if it's not gonna be good, I'm not gonna publish it. So forget about how many times you blog, make sure that when you do it, you do it well. And find things that other people are not writing about. And that might seem hard, but you can feed off other things. So for example, I saw things about where to host weddings in Denver, but everyone's, I have a lot of those articles. What about a pop-up wedding? Have you heard of that before? Well, not many people are gonna be interested in a pop-up wedding, but it's just another piece of content that nobody else has, that when people search on Google, less people that will search for a wedding, but the ones that will search for a pop-up wedding, it's gonna be number one because there aren't many people that write about pop-up weddings. And aggressive outreach. You know, TJ asked me, how do you find those relationships with journalists? Guess what? You gotta be aggressive, right? No one's gonna come knock on your door and say, I really love, and maybe they will, but I don't like taking chances. If you're gonna hope they're gonna find you, then you're being really optimistic. The way the Denver Ear grew um, as fast as it did, because I am relentless, on outreaching businesses. And you know where the best place to do that? It's Facebook. Because Facebook gives business pages a responsive rate. So when you go to a business page and they write you a, like you write them a message on their business page, if they don't respond fast enough, Facebook is gonna penalize them for that. So I use that to my advantage and I reached out to all of these businesses and like publications and I'm like, hey, I have this blog, or hey, I have this article, you might be interested, and I did it on Facebook Messenger for the page, and guess what, they're answering. And they don't immediately publish it, sometimes they're like, thank you, but don't do anything. Guess what, aggressive outreach means doing it again, and again, and again, and not worrying if they're rejecting you. So if they're not answering, okay, I'll write you again. Have you seen the Shawshank Redemption? And that he has the library, they opened the library in, in the jail because he kept on sending letters. That's what I do every day. I will like literally hound journalists on email, messenger, until they're like, just give the girl the article already. Like, we don't wanna hear her. And then as soon as that happens, I write them twice for the next one. And then from there, it's like, hey, would love to grab a cup of coffee so that we can see how we can work together. And then you start working with people. And then like, who are you behind the page? Cause you know, you only see the page would love to get to know you and then let's be friends on Facebook too and just don't worry about what people think about you. You are behind a screen, nobody cares, you can be as aggressive as you would like and that will push you much faster. And the traffic wise, so... <laughs> so in terms of traffic, the Den like Team Denver Homes, the real estate, our website, um, had last year 90,000, and that might seem like a lot for you guys, but the Denver Ear gets 150,000 unique hits a month. And out of those, only 90,000 throughout the whole year moved to Team Denver Homes. So there is a lot of traffic out there, um, and converting it from the lifestyle is a great way to do that because they are so interested in what you're writing about that they want you to be their realtor. And here's like, also, like another news flash, you do not need to write about communities either. You, if you're a photographer on the side and you love taking photography, then write a blog about photography. If you're a salsa dancer, write about salsa dancing. You know why? Because your clients are gonna choose you because they resonate with who you are because they are like you. Your clients mirror you. Yes, you're gonna have a few clients that are not like you, but most of the time, generally speaking, people will work with you because they feel like they are like you. So 
Finding people to buy and sell a property with you is not because you're telling them about real estate or lifestyle. It's because they feel like they like you and they know you. So go ahead and if you're like an organic like baby food maker, go ahead and like talk about how great it is to make organic baby food. Another mom that does the same thing is going to see that you're a realtor and say, oh my gosh, I love making organic baby food too. Let, can you help me sell a house? <laughs> like sure, but can we make organic baby food while we're doing it? Uh, so that's just to show you guys that like traffic is there. Like, do it in any form that you can. If you can do it community-based, that's going to be great as well. Um, and tying it all together. So, like I said, I did a real soft approach with the Denver Ear, and I did that intentionally. I wanted really to not be as aggressive with the readers as I am with the aggressive outreach with the journalists. So for the readers, I'm not pushing real estate that much at all. At the end of each article, it just says, hey, are you interested in Denver real estate? I'm also a realtor. Um, on every newsletter, at the end of the newsletter, it has the team photo, and nobody advertises on my blog. And I get like literally emails daily. Hey, we'd love to put a banner on your blog. And when when you get to that point, resist the urge to make five hundred dollars a month by putting ads on your. Um, blog because what you have to remember is if you're doing it for real estate the only thing you want people to know on your blog is that you're a realtor because if I'm gonna convert someone it's gonna be to the real estate and nobody else so the soft approach is getting them to like the content return and then they're gonna say who wrote who keeps writing this great content and then they're gonna find it there the real estate there on the top of the page you can click on it and it will go directly to that they have to go especially and the newsletter is there. So you can take a more aggressive approach by putting it on your real estate. That's totally fine. But just remember that if you're going down this route, you want to not try to get the business right away. You want them to slowly come in with that. How many years? It's been for all, uh, three and a half years. I started three and a half years ago. And the production that we've seen, it's in part due to the news. It's about the real estate and the blog. And so year one, 7 million production. Year two, 15 million production. This year, Jamie and I are in 36 million production closed. And we are going to hit 50 million most likely. So you're not going to see it right away. But believe in it. Continue believing it. I mean, you know, I was told so many times when I started and I put so much emphasis on the blog that I'm wasting my time that real estate is done with referrals and clients. And that is absolutely true. But the referrals and the clients read the blog too. And if you're just patient and you're not like, if you know, the magic happens right when you're about to quit. I was right about to quit after a year and a half. I didn't see any change in my business. And I decided, you know what? I spent so much time on this. I am not giving up. I believe in this idea. And right when I was about to quit and decided to push forward, that's when the deal started to come in. So believe in yourself even when nobody else believes in you. So what is really important is to also remember that the Team Never Homes is where the business is coming from. So connecting the two is super important. So when we're creating events, for example, this is our agent, our team, Olivia, and she um, has an open house in an area that's in Denver that's very urban, where there's lots of shops around it. So instead of just doing an open house, we reached out to the businesses around the open house and said, hey, we're opening a house, right, that's walking distance to all the shops. Do you mind giving like exclusive coupons or exclusive discounts just to our, I guess, clientele if they come to the open house? Now, the businesses don't care. Yeah, of course we would love to give you if they come to buy. So then for the open house, we're handing out coupons for the businesses when you're coming and it's exclusive to this open house. And then when we go to listing presentations, we can say, do you want to sell a property with us? Because if you do, we'll create a special event around your property and reach businesses so that shoppers and home buyers will be able to overlap. And that's a great way. And it was sponsored by the Denver Ear, which is ridiculous, but it works because they see that as another avenue and it's another way to feed it. In terms of the, the website, when you're putting out ads, people ask us, like that billboard, like, what, like first of all, like, what is it for? Like, why did you just put the domain? Because guess what? The only way you can track how well your outreach is 
is if you're seeing a spike in your traffic. So when we put a billboard out, we're like, well, how are we going to know if, we even, if it even worked? The only way to know is if we have a domain and all of a sudden we're going to hit our traffic and see that the traffic during the time that the billboard was up actually spiked. So now we can see if it worked or if it didn't. Because if the traffic didn't spike, then the billboard isn't working anyway. So when you are putting stuff and you're spending money, and if you decide to go big or go home, which is what we do, then remember domain. Your domain is more important than your name because that's how you can track if you're doing And it. I lied. I do want to interrupt really fast on that one. So with the billboard, too, I, we didn't put this on here, but just so you guys understand the strategy behind it, Moore was really strategic when she started her billboard for the Denver Ear. The first one just had the denverear.com. Then we did a second one that was the denverear.com is teamdenverhomes.com. And then we did this one. So it's very slowly over, what, a year? Translated, same billboard, same location, and had this like stepping stone from one to the other to connect those dots. And when you're creating events, um, it's really important to also put, so for example, Denver Ear, when there is like a Team Denver Homeless event, um, I'll put it in the guide for other events. So that way, again, it's going through the back door. So instead of just doing an article about one event where you're hoping someone's going to click on it because they're interested in your specific event, the way we infiltrate our events is that I'll create a guide of events that happen throughout the whole month of November. So if you go to the denverear.com and now you'll see whatever, 26 things to do in November, one of those 26 things is our event. But because it's surrounded by big events in the city, like when people are clicking on the article, um, that gives it a lot of legitimacy. And now we are considered a big event because we keep positioning it with other big events too when we do write it about it ourselves too. So invest in yourself, invest in the future. If you're deciding to do a blog, remember, like put the effort to make it good, um, aggressive outreach, and be proud of what you do you know even if no one's reading it make sure that every person you talk to like everyone that comes to me hey what are you doing this weekend uh, the denverear.com just check it out and then you'll find out so remember to be your own proponent for your business don't be shy to say people what you do and market yourself in the way that if you would not read the article yourself do not write it thank you Hi, Dave. I'm never going to be able to top that, that stuff. The <laughs> it's always is, good to set expectations up front, right? Uh, <laughs> last week I was in California at the California convention and I gave this great speech. I thought I nailed it and everything was great. And then my assistant comes up to me and goes, yeah, that was okay. But while everyone else was talking, you were up there like a stone cold fish. And I was like, all right, now it's a toughie. So here we go. But it looks like you took some notes there for yourself. So you had a, a learning opportunity, notes. huh? Yes. So I edited a lot of my stuff just while we were talking because they already covered a lot of it. But one of the things I want to say is thank you guys for coming out and learning and be willing to get all this new information because what it does is a profession, it makes our realtors, makes us look a lot better. And it's, a, it's so important that we're professional. Things are changing right now. Um, in our market, we deal with very, very expensive homes and small little properties. And most of the agents can't really compete anymore because it's very expensive to market where we are. And there's so much clutter. There's a thousand agents out there and they're all kind of getting lost. And so doing things like this that are not expensive can really separate you and, and you can drive a wedge and you can get a lot of market share. So it's really good to see this kind of stuff. So when we started out, we've been together, my wife and I, 27 years, but we've been working together for probably 27 of those. And there was no internet, there was no marketing, and there was no, no, no cell phones. Can you imagine how we did that? No smartphones. But every time that new technology came, my wife was very sure to jump on it and do it really quick. So the early adapters makes a huge, huge difference. So what you see today it's going to be so fast and changing in a couple of years so it's great to be out there and to kind of make sure you're on top of it a long time ago agents were the gatekeepers of all the real estate information the mls what was going on in your neighborhood nobody could get access to that 
But now that's out there for everyone. You know, your clients know as much, if not more than you, because they're hyper-focused on their little neighborhood. So you got to be changing what you do. So now we're connectors, you know, realtors are connectors. We connect with people and then we connect those people with homes. And that's kind of like what we're doing here today, right? So social media is a major tool. And the one thing is you got to be careful not to get overwhelmed. I, I have a team of people and I have specific people that handle things for me because I'm so busy be dealing, dealing with buyers and sellers, that's where we make our money and that's where we really provide the best service. So you gotta have a balance. Once you get a few things going and a few of these great ideas, you shouldn't spend that much time on them every week. And the beauty of social media is you don't really need to. And like you can copy content and you gotta be smart about it. So today I wanna focus basically on quality content, and how you can quickly share that around. So we have a big team, and it's okay if you don't because it's still the same basic things. But my role is to manage what's going on. And one of the things that my wife really is good at is making sure that our voice out there is what we are, represents what we are. And so she does, we do, we do more of the management of it. So... It used to be a point where your website was a really big thing. When websites first came out, a lot of you probably weren't even born, right? You guys weren't. So, <laughs> <laughs> so all your information was driven there, and the whole goal was to drive people to your website. And so now, social media is so much more encompassing, and it goes in through the thread of all your daily fabric of your life, when you meet someone at open house or somebody refers someone to me, chances are they've already heard about us through social media. And so what my goal is, is to get them back to my website if they're very interested because that shows what we do for you, how much business we do, and then it links you right into all of the other things that we can provide. Um, so you need to know what your, your audience, and each channel is different. And LinkedIn is totally business. Like, you don't want to have that kind of photo up there. LinkedIn is your digital resume. So you don't want to have your personal life or your things like that. Keep it strictly. You don't want to show that to a prospective employer. And that's what everybody on social media is, especially when you're a realtor. Everybody is a potential employer. So you want to keep it positive. Um, Stay out of controversy, stay out of politics. And I love it when all the other agents get all fired up and they start talking stuff on social media. And I fire them up, I tell them, great job, you guys are doing great. <laughs> so you don't want to blur the lines between personal and private, I mean uh, business. Get a business page and then on your private one, do the settings so it's very restrictive so it, it stays private. See the next slide? Life is fun, right? You want to keep it private, though, because people aren't going to respect you if you're throwing up stuff like this. And then, okay, this is great. This guy looks exactly like my main competitor in town and he's a good friend of mine, and I've been telling everybody that it's him. <laughs> So one of the first steps you want to do is make a profile page and you want to make sure it's complete and filled in. This is a great example. It happens to be me up there. Um, you put a background in. This is for the people that aren't very educated and ready to go. This is for the novice. Put a background photo that shows you do real estate. Make sure you have a professional headshot and then update it regularly. This is when you put content on here, people want to see everything is professional. They want to take it seriously. So when you tell them something, it's just going back to your credibility. So on your business page, just keep it professional. And then uh, on Instagram, it's all about the image, right? And that's what gets people. And I have a million followers on that. And that's, for our market, that's a pretty good way to, to get attention. Make sure the images are great, great photos, quality is important. You got to move the hoses, right? You got to move the trash cans, make sure the car's not there, turn the lights on in the house, make it look good. And the number of people that don't do that just makes you look so much better. 
So Snapchat, if you want to be a little more social, this is a channel where you can be a lot more social, right? Um, you can put content in there that people in your town will find interesting. So every month, our team does a beach cleanup. So we had the basketball team out from the Redondo High School. They came out and we featured them. So we spotlight that team. And what that does, it shows you're really active in your community. And then it's a great way to put your brand out there without you non-salesy way, you know, without too much effort. There's a whole lot of channels out there, and we focus on three major ones. But we do give some attention when we're, when we're a little slower, we have time, to the other ones. It's kind of like if you have the spinning plates, right? You have a stick, you put the plate up there, it takes a while to get it going, you get it going, you do a second one, you get that going, and then you got to go back and tune up the first one, and then the second one, and then you do a third one. So take it one at a time, don't let it overwhelm you. All this stuff that these guys have been doing, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of expertise. Don't worry, you'll get there. You'll get there real quick. And then um, quality over quantity, that's what they were saying. And that means everything. You can have 20,000 followers, but if they're not the right followers and they don't do what you need them to do, it's not going to help your business, and they're just going to be annoyed. They're going to be annoyed that you're putting all that stuff out there. This is one of the things. When technology comes up and all the brand new things, you don't always know how to handle it. So the first time that it came out, it was really important to have a lot of followers. So we spent a lot of money and a lot of time getting all these followers, and then after you learn, that's not really the right way to go. So by going to these kind of seminars, you can learn from our mistakes and save a ton of money. Always be thinking on the content. Wait, Dave, before you go on, your target audience is really important to you guys in California and in your market in Manhattan Beach. Um, so I love that you had that list up there, the, who you're targeting. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that's been really helpful for you all. Who, rather than just broad scattering thing? So our target market is pretty interesting because our town has completely changed in 20 years. 20 years ago, it was 90% engineers based at TRW, Northrop, everything from the aerospace industry at the LA airport. And then after the Cold War, 60% of those guys left in three months. It just shut down and it was over. Since then, it's become a real destination spot. It's been great for our business. But we're attracting people from New York, from San Francisco, Chicago, and a lot from Silicon Valley. Because Silicon Valley is like moving down to Santa Monica. They call it Silicon Beach now. So our target audience is really those areas that are bringing big money people into our area. Plus, 80% of our business really is people in our town just moving around because it's so expensive to, to get closer to the beach or if you need more room and you have kids and you want a yard. That's, that's what happens. So our target audience is really narrow that it's our town and then it's really broad because it's where the big money's coming in. We try to give them inside information to our particular market and we give them really good information about trends and pocket listings and, and things that you just can't get on Redfin and all those other areas. So we focus on that and it's important to know. Yeah, and those secrets again. It. You're talking about those secrets again, secrets aren't are you? Secrets are good to have, yeah. That's it. Now I'm moving on. Questions? We're, we're moving on. We're moving on. One other thing, though, I wanted to mention. Here's kind of an example you were talking with us about um, last night. How because you have a team, and how many people are on your team? So we have five admin people and then 12 agents. Right, so with a huge team, you still want to have a little bit of control over your content, but you want people to be sharing it as well. I mean, you want people to share content. And, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, there's that. We that. smithed the slide. This is a good one, right? Yeah, here. yeah. So when we do a post, we put it out to our 1,700 people, and then we give it to all of our agents, and they throw it out there, and now we're reaching 4,000 people. But those are 4,000 very good, very narrow leads. And, and those are the people who live in town, and, and they can share that information. That's super powerful. And if you do an Instagram, Instagram story behind that, um, you can do it again, reach all those people. That's one site, two posts, and it takes you about 10 minutes. So I have a question, actually. So we have agents 
Should we ask them to post our listings on their personal, though? I would feel I would want them to corner them for them to feel like they are obligated to start doing that. Are they posting it on their personal pages? So each one of them should have a personal page and their professional oh, page. So yes, on their professional page, absolutely. And then I guess just if they want to on their personal page, that's a right. and brownie the, points. <laughs> brownie, yeah, brownie points. And that's part of that. <laughs> on being on a team, we want to hand feed them and take care of all that stuff because it can take a lot of time. And that way they can just focus on buyers and sellers, but represent themselves as very professional and in the know. So you're giving them the tools, you're giving them the team value to be able to go out there and be the agents that they are yes. and to show themselves as such. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dave Kasky. Thank you, guys. All right, I think you guys got a few tips there, didn't you? But maybe you have a few questions, and we do have a few minutes, so there are two microphones here. If you have a question, please come forward, and uh, if it's to someone specific, go ahead and address them. Um, but also let us know who you are and where you live. Hey, I want to see Mark Wahlberg too. Wait for me. <laughs> we got plenty of time. Mark's not till four. Uh, Monica, there's someone over there. Oh. I'm pretty loud. I have a question for Mark. Um, I apologize. I don't remember your association. Jamie? She writes her press release. She has somebody write them. Do you have somebody write their articles? So the articles that have my name on them will always only be written by me. I started um, hiring content writers for freelance to fill it in simply because the more business um, we started to get um, from the blog too, it was just really hard. So whatever I have my photo on is definitely written by me and whatever I don't isn't just because I want to be genuine, but I have slowly started to freelance that work the more business comes for the real estate. All right. Uh, what uh, percentage of traffic comes from your blog that goes to your web to the real estate? How website? much from the blog itself? Uh, the Denver Ear. Yeah. So twenty percent overall has at least once went to Team Denver Homes, and that is only if they went. I only can find out if they went the Denver Ear and then Team Denver Homes. If they found out about it and then went on their own to Team Denver Homes, I won't know. But I see direct traffic is twenty percent. And then follow-up question, how many posts or how many blog posts do you have on the Denver here total? So right now, total, I have about over 800, but it's been up for three and a half years. And don't forget, the first year and a half, I had no business almost, so I just wrote content all the time. So <laughs> a lot of those happened earlier on. Yeah. But And remember, too, they, they keep living there. I mean, I have a blog, and I write on it very infrequently now, and I still get calls and credibility from it, and it doesn't have 800 posts. So Thank you. Thank you. This would be a question for you. Again, do you keep repeating your content? Yes. So if you go on the Denver today, you'll see eight things to do this in Colorado this winter. Um, every year, I go back to that article, I update it, I change it, and I republish it. That's awesome. good. Okay. Yeah. And then um, as far as your community events, where are you sourcing your information? Like we've got several around uh, the community that I'm in, uh, but where do you get yours? Do you just get it off other sites? Do you... So the way I started was I go on Facebook and I pressed events and I searched for events around the town. And then I would, but the most important part for you to stop doing that, you have to reach out to them and let them know that you wrote about them. So I wrote about the events and I said, hey, I tagged them, like that I wrote an article about them. And then they just started to know about me. So but initially, initially you have to do your own research. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Hi, my name is Stephanie and I work for Vacasa and we sell vacation homes in Portland, Oregon. And I have a question about live events. So when you're hosting an event, and this might be for, for Boise, and you are doing a theme and you're creating a whole experience, can you share some tips and techniques to get people to go to those events and in a place where there are bajillions of events happening every single evening? No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Do we have any brainstorm ideas for that for a I minute? mean, we, we just post it through our channels, and we expect people to show up. So are you talking about like going live or, the, or getting them to the events that we getting do? Getting them to the events that you do. Good door prizes are good generally. But yeah, I mean, honestly, we've got about uh, almost 14,000 people following us between Facebook and Instagram. We expect on everything that we do that 20 to 40 people show up. And that's about like what we can handle. If there was more than that for the types of events that we do, we couldn't host it anyway. So we, we just expect the right 20 to 40 people show up. And it's different faces all the time. 
So I, I see a few, and this is not what we do, but I've seen some businesses do that. So they will do on their event on Facebook, sold out in caps, even though it's not sold out. And then afterwards, they're releasing some more tickets to it after it's sold out exclusively, and that creates a hype. So make sure that you try to like make it smaller so it sells out, and that just makes it look much better, and people want to attend it because it's sold out. And I'm just going to chime in too. It doesn't help you as far as getting people to the event, but one of the things that we're really big on when we do events, it's the awareness about the event. So we consider a successful event when we had a really high click rate on our newsletter for that event, or how many times it was shared in the interaction on social because it's still putting us out in front of people even if nobody actually comes to the events. Yeah, it's the pre and post of the event that's actually usually, you know, yeah. the more important aspect of it anyway. Great. Thanks, guys. And I think one of the things from TJ's that we've learned too is if you're getting good information out about yourself and your neighborhood, you're going to create more followers who will then will see the event when it's posted. So remember, there's always a challenge. Just because you post it doesn't mean people see it. So that off event time is as important as the on event time again. Thank you. Yeah, yes, sir. So I do agent interaction for Open Door, and I've got a question for the panel. And I really I want to take it down to complete basics and ask kind of a what might be considered a total dumb question, but I bet you half the people in this room have a similar question. No question. They're all welcome. Go ahead. What is Instagram? Keep it simple. And, and on a totally basic level, how does it apply to real estate? How does it what? How does it apply to residential real estate? Oh, super basic. Should I take this one first? Go ahead, Moore. You um, take it. Instagram is a way to share photography, and real estate is a good... Its use is to share the photography of the brand, which is your agents yourself, and photography of the property in order to have visually appealing content that people want to look at. It's an in, inexpensive way to keep your brand and your identity out there that, that everybody can do versus $100,000 know, newspaper ads all the time. And I'm going to chime in that as far as how it relates to residential real estate is people buy a house for the lifestyle. And so this is a really good way to capture that in an image. Yeah, for, for us, um, our target market of people care about visual aesthetics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we use Instagram to post stuff that's visually stunning, that captures our audience of people that want to consume that type of visual information. And what's the next step after you capture their attention? What should they do? So for us on Instagram, we don't really use it as a tool that gives us an immediate lead. That's not what we use Instagram for. We use Facebook for that by getting them to landing pages and collecting their information. Occasionally, we will post a picture on Instagram that says, to get a list of homes, mid-century homes in Boise, Idaho, click the link in our bio, and it will take them to our landing page. But it's, we don't use it that way very often. We just kind of intermittently use it that way because we're always changing our bio link with whatever's most relevant to what we're posting at the time. So we do do it as a lead generation tool. You can't do it when you're putting it in the actual like post, but if you create an ad on Instagram, you can make the ad have a link. So we create a lead generation where we're sending out ads on Instagram that do not sit on our profile page, only as an ad that you won't see if you go to the profile and there if it's learn more they click on it and then they're prompted to enter their uh, full name their phone number and their email and we are generating between 40 to 50 leads per listing directly from instagram for a specific listing and we don't care if they convert for us it's to show the seller hey Look what we're doing. We also put your property on Instagram. We got 40 people that were interested. So we're using it more to sell ourselves back to the sellers to show value. Another thing that we have with both Instagram and social media is we kind of have a secondary demographic of agents when we come and speak at things like this that follow us. And we connect with them a lot and do a lot of ingoing and outgoing referrals that way. So it generates business that way. Great. Excellent answers. Thank you for keeping it sort of basic. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. What do you think about, because um, I personally find it really frustrating, 
the um, realtor who you cannot find contact information no matter what, no matter how, because you have to fill out, you, you have to give them, you fill out contact us, right? And then you send it. Why do realtors do that? I don't understand. <laughs> Because there's no way for me to contact you. I leave the site and go on. I'll go, you go, take that. Where I can contact you. It's the, wait, did Deborah hear the question? She doesn't understand, understand now why there's like sign in walls, basically, to get agents' contact information. I agree. It's annoying. I don't like doing it myself. But if you want to be successful, you've got to build a database. Period. It's why Zillow makes the money that they do. They've got a database, they have your information, they have your listing, they're remarketing it to everybody else. If you own a database, you own an income stream. And if you're not building a database, you're not generating the income that you could be generating. We do it, try to, we try to do it tastefully in, in a way that we understand that it's annoying. So we try to do it in a way that's not as blatant. Show me the first picture and enter more information to see the rest. I hate that yeah. myself. Yeah, but, but, but we don't even do that. So we just advertised, do you want a list of mid-century homes in Boise, Idaho? Because there's always you know, 50 to 80 that you can purchase. But if you want a direct link to the MLS for that data, give us your information, we'd be happy to send it to you. And people do comment, you lost me at giving a phone number, I'm not doing that. So I pop in and I go, hey, no problem, send us a direct message and we'll send you the link. Right, like I'm trying to keep it friendly. This, so. is, this is a business model decision. And one of the things that I want to note from what TJ said, connecting, having to get people's information, it still always is great to get people's, uh, their information. But what I observe too in like the content marketing and the email list gathering, all of that is a rolling stone that's moving fast. And so where something comes up and it's popular and people do it for a while, well then people don't like doing the sign-ins now, so they like the other ways to connect like Instagram Messenger or Facebook Messenger and they're looking at other ways. So as agents, we need to be attentive to what's working and what's not working because those technologies and the way our consumers are responding to them are changing, I mean, honestly, monthly, I mean, six months, it could be completely different. So, thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, I see more and more on Facebook some uh, real estate agents who are using like 360 content and virtual tour. What's your takes on that and how do you, do you use it and uh, how do you use it if you do? Do you mind just repeating the question? What do they put on Facebook? Yeah, uh, 360 content, like 360 photography where you can look around. Oh. Yeah, the, the, like the Matterport type. Yeah, well, no, are you talking about the Matterport or 360 the or just their Facebook Live kind of things where so they're... There is two different things. There is a 360 picture that you post on Facebook and that appears directly in the Facebook feed and you can just browse around and look around the place. And then there is a more advanced Matterport type of virtual tour. I'm interested about both, so... Well, you know, I want to comment on, it's interesting you brought up the video thing, because I actually wanted to say, bring this out. I don't know if you guys noticed that none of these teams specialize in video. So for those of you who are scared of video, I want you to notice, it's part of what all of they do, it's part of their business, but it's not the main center point of any of them, and they're successfully building that. So with that being said, just real quick, Facebook likes organic content, so they want you to post it to there. Don't share from YouTube and stuff. What are you guys finding just in your general professional um, kinds of use of video are the most responsive, are people responding to? Uh, we like to do video that is, we're not trying to sell the property in the video. So if you go to our Facebook page, Teen Denver Homes, our videos are fun. Um, we are not trying to sell. We just want people to be excited because um, if you just do a video of a property and nobody's in it, it's really boring and people are going to drop out in like five seconds. So remember, have humans in videos will um, keep people engaged longer. So I pref would prefer even, a, I guess, a less quality like video and an agent talking to the, to the screen rather than just a really pretty video of a house. In terms of 360, the 360 camera... Um, it's not as important, in my personal opinion, on social media like it is for putting it on the website because we use that to get out-of-state buyers that are unsure about how the layout of the property is. And when we do an article or a press release or an outreach for an out-of-state buyer, we're going to direct them to the 360. Everything else is going to be more of a static visual. 
And I want to make a note of that too. Is uh, when I travel around speaking, I'll often go and research the markets that I'm going to and see how people are selling things like that. And so I put myself in the consumer's shoes quite often then. And I find that both the 360 videos and the Matterport videos can be challenging to work through and get through sometimes. So I really love what you just said more. They're there for a specific person in a specific place. As a consumer, I'm ready to move on from them pretty quickly. Thank you. Thank you so much again to our guests, TJ Pierce, Moore Zucker, Jamie Slough, and Dave Kasky. You can read more about them, their bios and their contact information in the show notes, which are available wherever you find your podcast on the podcast app or at crdpodcast.com. It's kind of a transcript with uh, the detailed information about them on the show notes. All right. I want to challenge you to share the podcast with a friend this month. Who do you know who needs this great information that you can share the podcast with? Also, if you want to continue the learning, remember, these are our places to get information about online and live classroom training. Now, the online learning is from our sponsor, the Center for Realtor Development. That is at onlinelearning.realtor. And the classroom training, you can find that at trainingforre.com. And then at crs.com, you can find the Residential Real Estate Council courses that are online and live in the classroom. So keep getting your education, keep improving your business so you can serve your clients better and grow the business that you would like to have. So go sell some houses and I look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks for listening to the Center for Realtor Development podcast. If you like what you just heard, we hope you give us a positive rating on iTunes and pass along our podcast web address, crdpodcast.com, to your friends and colleagues. If you have any questions or suggestions for future show topics or ideas about how we can improve, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Just email us at crd at realtors.org. This show is sponsored by the Center for Realtor Development, an online learning platform owned and operated by the National Association of Realtors.